chapter number 2 tonight. We're going to continue the message that we started this morning on the subject of the enemy within us. The enemy within us. And uh, I think it's important that we hear this message. Uh, praise the Lord for it. I didn't get very much of it done this morning. Uh, but when the Lord tells you to cut it off and stop, that's what you do. And you don't just keep on going on just because you got an outline laying in front of you. And so the Lord said to stop that thing after the first point. And we're going to pick it back up tonight. 1 John chapter number 2. Now you've been sitting a little extra time, so let me give you a chance to stand up on your feet a moment. And uh, we'll read our scripture together, have a word of prayer, and then you may be seated and we'll get into the message tonight. I know it's hard to sit. It really is. Hard to stay seated for a long It is for me. All right, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. Listen carefully to the word of God. Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Father, Thank you for the word of God tonight. Thank you for the good singing of the choir and a special number. So grateful for good music, good solid conservative music that honors and glorifies you. Thank you, dear Lord, for Brother Matthew Frank and his wife Hannah and their uh, children Titus and Savannah coming and being with us uh, in the service tonight. And we pray for him and we pray for the work that you've given him to do. Now, Lord, we ask your blessing upon the reading of the word of God and upon its preaching tonight, and I pray you'll fill and anoint me with the power and unction of the Holy Spirit, uh, Lord, that we may magnify the name of Christ and that we may exalt you. And dear Lord, that you be pleased with the preaching. Please speak to every heart tonight. May each heart pay close attention to the Word of God this evening and not disregard and not ignore the voice of the Lord that may be dealing with their heart, but respond to Him and dear Lord, may they come to you tonight. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. And um, that don't mean I'm going to preach a long time. I just wanted to give you a little break there. Now this morning we began a message out of these three verses of Scripture in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And we spent quite a bit of time introducing the thought about the enemy that's within us. And John here, under the Holy Spirit, right, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, identifies the enemy that lies within us. And the enemy is the world. And we reminded all of us this morning that when John wrote that, he wasn't talking about the planet and he wasn't talking about the people on the planet. But we, we studied and understood, came to understand what the word world it comes from and what that word cosmos means. And uh, we made mention that it was the world system or the world order. And the Lord told us to not love the world or uh, the world order and the world system. But what really got my attention in my studies about that word cosmos or the world was the latter part of the definition. Let me remind us again of what that word means. It is the whole circle of earthly goods, endowments, riches, advantages, pleasures, which although hollow, frail, and fleeting, st stir the desire, seduce from God, and are obstacles to the cause of Christ. These are the things that are our enemy within. These things that are obstacles to the cause of Christ. And it is earthly things, pleasures, riches, endowments, advantages, and pleasures. This morning we made mention that we spoke about the character of the world. We wanted to identify our enemy, what it is, what is our enemy. And we, we, we learned that our enemy, the world, has a prince whose name is Satan. And we learned that our enemy has a philosophy, and that is to do evil. And we found that the world, our enemy, also has a purpose. And that is to draw people away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now tonight I want to get into the message and I want to speak secondly out of verse number 16 tonight on the corruption 
of the world. We need to understand the corruption of the world. And John very, in very much detail outlines that for us. Now when we spoke of the character of the world, we spoke about what it is. We defined what our enemy is. But under the second part tonight in verse 16, under the corruption of the world, we want to understand what it does, what our enemy does, what the world does. Now I want you to notice first of all that in verse 16 he begins to identify what this enemy does. He says, for all that is in the world. Now remember he told us to, not, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now in verse 16 he says, for all that is in the world. The world system, the world order, and all those things that make up our enemy, the world. And he says that they are broken down into three categories that we need to be aware of. First of all, he says, there is the lust of the flesh. Now, most everybody in here tonight understands what the lust of the flesh is in one form or another. The lust of the flesh, we need to understand, deals with our passions. It deals with our passions. The things that we give our love and our money to. You remember me saying that this morning? That what our passion is is what we give our love and our, our time and our money to. Now the lust of the flesh deals with our passions. Now what is the world's agenda? Why is the lust of the flesh being used by the prince of the world against people? Well, the lust of the flesh is used by Satan to appeal to your old nature. That's what the lust of the flesh does. It, it appeals to your old nature. Now, if you had a problem uh, with a certain type of maybe an addiction before you were saved, let's just say you had an addiction to alcohol before the Lord saved you and you were consumed with that addiction and you just had to have that, uh, that, that addiction and you had to have that alcohol, you thought, to get through your day and uh, what have you. And then the Lord comes along and He convicts you of your sin. You repent of that sin and the Lord delivers you from that addiction and saves you by His marvelous grace and puts you on the path to eternal life by His precious blood. The devil is not impressed with that. Now the devil can't do a thing with your soul. Oh no, that's private property. He can't ever come in and rob God of your soul. He can never do that. You're as safe in the hand of God as you could be anywhere. And the devil can never have you. But the devil knows what used to draw your flesh. And that's where he's going to hit you. Now see, I've never had an addiction to alcohol. And so the devil's not going to come to me and appeal to me about drinking alcohol. I've, I've, I've not done that. I've never been addicted to that. Uh, that doesn't bother me. You could wave a bottle of whiskey or whatever in front of my face and it's going to do me a bit of good. But there are other things in my life uh, uh, that the devil knows what, what buttons to push and he knows how to hit those buttons and he really knows how to put on the pressure to tempt you to do evil and to do sin. And he's going to hit you in those areas of your old nature. The things you used to love. You see, the lust of the flesh is not only Satan trying to appeal to your old nature, but the lust of the flesh is Satan trying to get you to satisfy the appetite of your human nature. And so you think about the areas of your life where the devil hits you. Everybody in here tonight has some place in your life, some sensitive place, something that you had trouble with before you were saved and the devil comes and he tries to tempt you to go back to that old nature, that old human nature. That's the lust of the flesh. Now that's our enemy within us. And the, the lust of the flesh not only deals with our passion, but it has to do with our doing, what we do, how we respond, 
how we respond to the temptation that comes our way. Now I want to tell you something. Temptations come and they'll wear you out. Temptations will wear you out. The devil, don't, he don't know the word quit or let up. And you know what? He, when he sees you starting to slide a little bit and say, you know, that's not going to hurt just one time. And he'll say things to you like, one more time for old time's sake. Those kind of lies, uh, I see the nodding of the heads and the amens. You've battled that, haven't you? That enemy, just because you've been saved, doesn't mean that that enemy called the lust of the flesh has gone away. As a matter of fact, when you were lost and and the devil already had you and you weren't going to heaven, you were going to hell, you already belonged to the devil by your very nature, he didn't bother with you too much, did he? What was the use of him bothering with you? He already had you. But you see, he hates, our enemy hates God. And he's going to do all he can to try to draw us away and make us to fall back into sin by the lust of the flesh. Keep that in mind. The lust of the flesh deals with Satan appealing to our old nature. But then he speaks about, secondly, the lust of the eyes. And the lust of the eyes doesn't have anything to do with our passions. But the lust of the eyes has everything to do with our possessions. Many times it is the young people that have the biggest problem with the lust of the flesh. And many times it is the older generation, I didn't say the seniors, (coughs) I said the older generation, older than the young people, that start having problems with the lust of the eyes. Because this deals with our possessions. And just as the lust of the flesh has to do with our doing, the lust of the eyes has to do with our having, our possessions. How does the devil come? How does our enemy, the world, how does it come and tempt us in the lust of the eyes? Well, it comes in several forms. First of all, it comes in covetousness. It comes in starting to lust after something that doesn't belong to you. Something that's not God's will for you to have. But in your body, in your flesh, you've got to have that thing. It can be any kind of possession. And you get your eyes upon it. And you know what happens to us? It happens to everybody from time to time. You're not satisfied with what God's given. Did that sink in? You're not satisfied with what God has given you. You want more. You want more. If you want to understand the, 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 the process of, of the downfall of riches, yes, go read 1 Timothy chapter 6, but I would urge you to go read Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And Solomon over there in his great wisdom He described about five different things that money does to a person. Possessions, materialism, having things that are tangible that we can have and say that we have. And you know one of the first things or the first thing that Solomon talked about over in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 was this. He said the more money, or he called it silver, the more you got, the more you want. You're never satisfied with what God gave us. What did God promise us? God has promised us eternal life. What did God tell us to be satisfied with? He said the uh, uh, food and, and our clothing that we have. God has blessed us. God meets the necessities of our everyday life. The lust of the eyes is not desiring the necessities of life but the lust of the eyes is not being satisfied with what we have, but wanting more and more and more. Could I ask you a question tonight? What is more important tonight to you in your life? A holy life or a successful life? What do you want? 
What is the desire of your heart? So the lust of the flesh is about our passion. The lust of the eyes is about our possessions. But then there's a third avenue in verse number 16, and it's called the pride of life. Now what does that have to do? What is that? The pride of life. I heard one preacher one time call it security, having security. And I got to thinking about that and I thought, well now what does the pride of life have to do with security? Well let's understand what the pride of life attaches itself to. The lust of the flesh deals with our passion. The lust of the eyes deals with our possessions. Well what else is there? There is the pride of life. And that deals with our position. That deals our, with our position in this walk of life. You see, the pride of life doesn't deal with our doing or with our having, but it deals with our being, what we are. The pride of life is the desire to be recognized, acknowledged, and admired. You ever been tempted with that? If you've ever done anything for the Lord, that temptation has come. I want a little recognition. I want a little pat on the back. You know, there are people that, that they, can't, they just can't help themselves. They, just, they, they try to fight it, but they just can't help themselves. And, and when they want to get up and testify, and God help us, preachers do this. Get up and read a verse of Scripture and then spend an hour telling everybody what they've done. What they done, what we done, what I've done, how God has used me. No, we don't have any glory of anything we do. But Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm not interested in hearing what people have accomplished in their life. I'm interested to hear what God is doing. There is a desire to be recognized that admired and acknowledged. There's a desire to possess power and authority. To have power and authority. To be in a place where they are greatly admired and respected. You know the Bible talks about being a doorkeeper in the house of God. And a child of God has no business, no matter what position we may hold in the church or in the kingdom of God, we have no business seeking to be admired, acknowledged, or recognized. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. We should learn the lesson that John the Baptist made mention of in John chapter 3 and verse number 30. John had become quite popular. John the Baptist had quite a following. But John the Baptist said he must increase. I must decrease. He said there's one coming. Yeah, I'm standing out here preaching and I'm baptizing. But there's one coming after me who's uh, latchet of his shoes. I'm not worthy to untie. I'm not even worthy. And when Jesus showed up, he said, you ought to baptize me. Oh, not the other way around. My friend, let me tell you something. Heaven is filled with rewards for the faithful. And let me tell you something. God is going to give you far better reward for the work that you've done for him than man can ever give you down here. But if a person is satisfied with the admiration of people and, and the pats on the back and the good words, I hope you enjoy it because that's all you're going to get. I've known people that way. You, they, you can't motivate them to do anything unless you brag on them. There's something wrong with that. That's called the pride of life. Now when we think about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, we understand that we're attacked in those very ways. Satan comes and attacks us with the lust of the flesh. He, he attracts our old desires of our old nature. He comes and he attacks us and 
He makes our eyes to desire things that we don't have. And He comes along and desires uh, or, or it causes us to desire to be acknowledged and recognized. These are temptations that we all face every day. But I want you to know that this is nothing new. This isn't something that the devil just started. The woman in the Garden of Eden faced the very same thing. In Genesis chapter number 3, the devil comes to her in the form of the serpent and he tempts her in these very three ways. You say, well, how does he do that? He tempted her first with the lust of the flesh. The Bible says that when she saw the fruit was good for food the lust of the flesh. He convinced her that this fruit, though God had forbidden it, it was good because it reached out to a basic human need, hunger. And then he tempted her in the lust of the eyes when in Genesis 3 it says, and she saw that not only was it good for food, but it was pleasing to the eye. She desired it because it was something beautiful. It was something that that he convinced her that she really wanted to have. And then he tempted her with the pride of life. When the Bible says it was, it was something that, would, uh, that she desired or it was desirable to make one wise. The devil convinced that woman, and you understand that story in the book of Genesis. Don't ever believe for a second that Adam was deceived and tempted and just couldn't help himself and took that fruit. That's not the case whatsoever. The Bible says it was the woman, that the woman was beguiled. I'm not saying that to down the women. I'm, let me explain myself. He went after the woman, and she saw the fruit was good for food. She saw it was pleasing to the eye. And she saw that it was one that would make one wise. The devil convinced her if she took that fruit, not only would her desire for hunger be satisfied, her desire of having the possession of the fruit would be hers, but she would be as smart as God. And she took the fruit and she she ate of it. And when she ate of that fruit, she defiled herself for all of eternity. And the Bible says that she gave unto her husband And he did eat. The husband had been told by God that all of the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Adam could never say, well, I didn't know the consequence of taking that fruit. That story of Adam and his bride is a picture of the church in Jesus Christ. And you and I are the woman in the story of Adam and Eve. We're fallen. We have a fallen nature. We're sinners by our very nature. Did Adam have to take that fruit? No. He could have run her out of the garden at that moment, said, you're defiled, get out of this holy place. But he said, give me the fruit. And he took that fruit because he loved his bride more than he did his own life. And he took the fruit. And he loved that bride so much that he was willing to lay down his life so that he and her could continue to have fellowship one with another. And that's what Jesus Christ did for you. But she's not the only one that faced that. You see, as 4,000 years of time passed and God sent forth His Son in the fullness of time, made of the woman, made under the law, and Jesus Christ came into the world, tabernacled in a body of flesh like you and like me. And when it came time for His earthly ministry to begin, John the Baptist baptized Him in the River Jordan. The Spirit of God descended from heaven upon Him in the form of a dove. And he began his earthly ministry and the first thing he did was to go out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. 
Why did he have to go out to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? Because he is our intercessor. He was touched with all the feeling of our infirmities, yet without sin. And when the devil came to him, how did he tempt him? He tempted him with the lust of the flesh. If thou art the Son of God, then turn these stones into bread. You think that God in the flesh couldn't have took about a dozen of them rocks and turned them things into hot biscuits and reached down and took some of that dust and made him a big old a jar of honey and some butter? and had him a time out there in the wilderness. He could have done that, but he knew we couldn't. And so he battled for you and for me the lust of the flesh. Then the devil tempted him with the lust of the eyes and carried him upon a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, I'll let you have all these things if you'll bow down and worship me. the lust of the eyes. And then he tempted him in the pride of life. He took him on top of the high point of the temple and said, why don't you jump off if you're the son of God? He said, because the Bible says that he'll give his angels charge that your foot shall not dash against the stone. And the Lord run the devil off with the word of God. For each time he says that the Word of God says, the Word of God says, the Word of God says. And that's how we'll defeat our temptation is by the Word of God. Now, let's look lastly at the conclusion of the world in verse 17. In verse number 17, we see the conclusion of the world where the world is headed. He says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You see, the world system is doomed. The world system is damned. And only those who fulfill the will of God in their life we'll be saved and we'll live forever. That's what the book says. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. It's the will of God for you to be saved. It's the will of God for you to live for Him. It's the will of God for you to defeat your enemy within now we've exposed him this morning and told you what he was we've exposed him tonight and told you what he does but tonight we expose him and tell you that his end is destruction as I close the message tonight I want to ask you another question or two about what's important to you. If you answer these questions honestly, it'll tell you where you stand. So what's more important to you tonight? The pleasure of your flesh or the joy of your spirit? What's more important to you? That which is seen or that which is unseen? The praise of men the glory of God that which is temporal or that which is eternal Oswald Chambers in his devotion my utmost for his highest made mention in one of his devotions I can't quote it but I'll just paraphrase it he talked about serving the Lord and he says but are you willing to serve the Lord as a doormat if that's the will of God for you first time I ever met Dr. Seitler I had him sign my Bible 
And I, I purposely went to see him that day to preach because I desired his prayers. I had just been called into the ministry and I desired that man of God's prayers. And I remember he pointed his finger at me and he said, young man, he said, you go serve God and you be happy where God puts you. And don't spend your whole life in ministry desiring something bigger or better. You be happy where God puts you and do what God said do. If you're living for this world, you're sailing on a sinking ship. But I'll say this and I'm done. Y'all can come on to the music. Do you know why so many people love the world? So many people love the world because they don't have anything else to love. That's all they got. And the Word of God reminds us in verse 15 that if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's our enemy within. Our Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that we've said some things out of the Word of God tonight that have been a help and a blessing. But Lord, I know that all of us in this room, we are tempted. We are tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is the purpose of the world, our enemy, is to draw us away from you. I really don't know what kind of invitation to give tonight, Lord. I pray that if there be someone here tonight that's lost without Christ, they'll come forward and receive Christ. We'll help them, we'll pray with them, explain it to them. But I pray for the children of God here tonight. For it is the children of God to whom this epistle was written. It was this stern warning about loving the world that was given to God's people, not to heathens. And I just pray, Lord, that tonight that you've touched hearts and pray, Lord, that your will be done in this invitation time. In Jesus' name we pray.